this is not a march. Minister Farrakhan said this is the 20th anniversary of what took place in October of 1995. But this is a stand for sober-minded and serious-minded people who know that we've entered into an era where injustice is being broadcast almost every minute across social media. And because of this, it is time for us to take a stand, not just blacks, but Latinos, our Indian family, and he even said even poor whites. There's injustices on so many levels in a country that says that its founding principles is life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So this is not a march, this is a movement uh, towards making the demand for justice, but also making sure that we're united, that if justice does not come from the government, then we have to implore the universal principle of justice for ourselves. Justice, you know what justice is, it's the principle of fair dealing. It is the balance on which the universe is actually constructed. In Arabic, they call it maizan, the universal principle of justice. But for us, who follow the Honorable Elijah Muhammad under the direction of Minister Farrakhan, justice is the principle of fair dealing. We built your country for you. We gave you 400 years, 310 years of free labor and the sweat of our brow, and we built this country. And now if you want to be sincere about your professed friendship with your so-called Negro uh, slaves, then divide the country with us. You've given every other nation that you offended reparations. When you go to Japan, you pay the victims of a three-year internment during World War II. You paid them. When you go other places, you pay reparations. Why is it that when you look at the Negro who built this country and has never been convicted of treason? See, when treason happens, that's your people. When treason happens, that's Jonathan Pollard, that's your people. Those are the white people who have the vested interest of living well in America. They betray you. We never betray you. We've been your good and faithful Negro servants, but that time is up. We're calling for justice or else. What is the or else? The first or else is this that we will begin to redistribute the pain that our people feel economically by boycotting your businesses and taking our dollars out of the cash bonanza that you profit from and then depart gleefully with baskets full of our money while we wander around the ghetto wondering what happened. So we're gonna redistribute the pain in agreement with and obedience to the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King who said that on April the 3rd, 1968, on the eve of his tragic and criminal assassination. He said that he wanted the black people of Memphis to redistribute the pain that we were suffering. So he told his uh, attendees that night, he told his congregation, I want you to make sure you don't buy Coca-Cola in Memphis. Don't buy butternut bread. He asked one of his assistants what was the name of another brand of bread. And he said, don't buy that bread. We're going to redistribute the pain that they make us suffer. Well, now on a national level, hmm, on a national level, 47 years after the death of Dr. King, black people suffer and Walmart profits and Target profits and Kohl's profits and the Koch brothers profits. I, I, think, I think my general response to the Million Man March is the same general response um, 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 that, that Malcolm X had to these sorts of marches is that they they don't do anything. These marches that we're having now don't do anything. They're not any policy specifications. Nothing is going to happen. The same thing that's happening of the Million Man March is the same thing that happened with the first Million Man March. This is just the remix, right? So the only thing that we're going to see is we're going to see Farrakhan kind of rebrand himself and try to insert himself as part of the Black Lives Matter movement. But you're not going to see any movement on any policy initiatives um, um, for, for African Americans. And part of that has to do with the fact that that's not even what Farrakhan's about. I mean, Farrakhan is sort of isolationist in this sort of pan-Africanist thing that black people should do for self. It's a very conservative ideology. So you're not going to see any of that. You you may get people may take some you know they didn't even collect names last time and that's that's key to organizing is collecting names, collecting numbers so you can mobilize people. You didn't even see that last time. So I think what you're going to see is is sort of you know the the hawking of you know maybe T-shirts you know putting Farrakhan on a platform where he can look like the 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 the, uh, the, the black leader who has been around for decades. But you're not going to see anything outside of that. So that's my main critique about the Million Man March remix. I'm not, I'm not going to spend, I, I, listen, 
the money I do make, I, I, I work hard for that money. I'm not going to anybody's march. I'm not going there. What? So we can prop up Farrakhan as the leader of black America. Farrakhan is the leader of the nation of Islam. He is not a leader of black America, first and foremost. And this idea that symbolism is somehow more valuable than substance is what we're engaging in by going to this march. I am not a I, I am not a party of that. People did that during the Obama administration. Oh well, he's the first black president. He's the first black family. Symbolically, that's a, that's important. And I'm not saying that symbolism doesn't have its place. I'm fine with symbolism. I was happy with symbolism when Obama was elected on the day of inauguration. After that, I moved on. And so, what black people need right now is re redress. What poor people need right now is redress. What we need right now, in terms of the African American community, we need policy initiative to redistribute wealth because that's what was taken from us. That's what was robbed from us. It was very interesting that Tana Hasi Coates wrote a wrote, wrote a piece on reparation. You know, this is the same. This is the same Tana Hasi Coates who was cheering. You know cheering Obama, Obama, and comparing Obama to Malcolm X. But under the first black president, we're back to the reparations conversation, and we're back to, we're back to Farrakhan. We're just breathing life into, into these sorts of ideologies and these sorts of ideas that I thought were dead in the 1990s. Now, I'm not saying that we don't deserve reparations. We do. But I think it says something about the, the, the first black president. It says something about black leadership that all we can do is rehash and regurgitate the same ideas that, that I was dealing with in 19. 94 in high school. Well, I mean, the, the only thing, the only thing I would, I would question the, the the nation of Islam leaders who are saying that this that this is somehow good for black people. I would, I would, I would just ask the question. You know, where where are all these black people staying when they get there? Are they all staying at, at, at black at the homes of black people who live in D.C. or black hotels in D.C.? Where are these people staying? Where are they eating? Are are you not circulating? If you want to talk about black buying power, aren't these people going to be shot? Going to be driving up there um, 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 with you know, and putting money in their gas tanks with, 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 with money that's financed by white capitalism? Aren't these people going to be, you know, aren't they going to be staying at hotels that are financed by that? Aren't they going to be flying on planes that are owned by white capitalists? I mean, how can you talk about, how can you talk about justice or else and, 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 and saving money on Christmas or wherever, you know, spending money, and then you're doing that, you're funneling, you're paying into that economy uh, uh, in terms of your trip to Washington, D.C. So I don't even see how any of this makes sense. I don't see how anyone could see this as anything other than than an opportunity for Farrakhan to rebrand himself and steal some of the energy um, from Black Lives Matter. And, 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 and it, was, it was very apparent to me that even when I even when I came out against the, the, the Million Man March remix, it was very apparent to me that they sent a 20-some-odd-year-old man to debate me because they want to tap into this young Black Lives Matter energy. They want to tap into that in terms of getting new blood and getting new leadership. I mean, those who are familiar with history remember that Malcolm X was the one who went around and got all the, you know, got people to join the Nation of Islam and built it up to what it was. You know, and Farrakhan... Farrakhan is getting old. They don't have that anymore. So just like you see the Pope going around now trying to rebrand, trying to make himself a softer, gentler Pope and talk about how, you know, capitalism is, you know, poor people, poor people are, are, are you know, we need to help poor people as if they're not sit sitting on millions on top of millions of dollars, talking about how bad, you know, arms are and how bad guns are, as if everybody who guards the Pope doesn't have a gun. You know, you see this sort of duplicity all over. And what I'm saying is that you're also seeing it with Minister Louis Farrakhan and they're black people should have better things to do on 1010 than go there and sort of sort of sort of codify him as as the leader of black people he's not he never was but he's certainly not today oh i just see it for what it is i see it as a marketing ploy this is a this is a marketing this is a branding experience for minister lewis farrakhan that's why he's going around taking pictures with eminem and being seen with kanye west because it's a perfect branding opportunity but it's not going to do anything for the black man or black woman who's poor who lives in the ghetto or lives in a rural environment who you know can't send their kids to school or can't can't feed themselves or and if you're in in, in in Detroit you don't have water it's not going to do anything. In 1964, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad introduced what was then called the three-year economic savings plan for the Black nation, and he was encouraging at that time that Black leaders and Black pastors and Black uh, leadership save five cents a day that we could put into a treasury to help the whole. There were many of us working hard in the field that we were on, but we were like a hand, that all the fingers have value, but we weren't together to strike with force economically. 
And so the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was imploring us at that time, let's put it in a treasury so that we could do those kinds of things because the nation at that time was a small microcosm of what he was talking about, of the do for sell. So it is in 2015, our people are in a worse condition than what they were in in 1964. So that hasn't changed. So the minister is asking that if we set aside 35 cents a week, that's not going to hurt anybody to put into a national treasury that our scholars and leaders and educators and, and financiers that understand economics could take that money and invest it in the best interest of our people who are suffering every day in abject poverty in the modern time. And so that should not be viewed so much as capitalism as if the minister is trying to gain money for himself. But what we will find in Minister Farrakhan is a credible man, a man that has the utmost character that would not take the money of the people and spend it and misuse it because he made it very clear that any misuse of that money, then those leaders should be willing to sign a certificate of death that the people could kill them if they misused the money. Now, that's very strong, but that's very real. But that is to secure the money, secure the mentality of the people that, look, we not playing. We not trying to rob nobody. Listen, I have no problem with black capitalism in terms of individuals wanting to better themselves individually. In terms of, in terms of what I do, Breaking Brown Media is a legally licensed corporation. If you want to do that for yourself, to better yourself individually, fine. What I have a problem is with this idea that that is somehow going to be the key to uplift for black people. It won't. It never will be. Less than This is something that black people with college degrees get engaged in. About less than 20 percent of black people have college degrees. OK, first of all, this is a this is a niche. And then not, and none of us and most of us are self-employed, meaning that we have a legally licensed corporation, but we only employ ourselves or maybe one or two more people. That is not enough to uplift the majority of black people. That is not enough to uplift the majority of black people who live in poverty or the majority of black people who live in the ghettos or the majority in black, of, of black people who don't have enough to eat. So what I'm saying, I'm not saying that you shouldn't start a business. I'm not opposed to business. What I'm opposed to is this idea that black capitalism will somehow rescue black people or it is the key to rescuing black people. There's no data that supports that. And this is something that this is something that the black bourgeoisie sort of engages in, too, um, in, in their in their desire to sort of to sort of replicate middle class and, and upper class white people. But and it, it, in terms of being a tool that black people can use to uplift the entire community, it doesn't have a chance. Well, first of all, as everyone knows, there are ideological and organizational differences within the movement. And we have to, as best as possible, try to manage those differences so we don't get pitted against each other again, like we were during COINTELPRO. The AAPRPGC had decided not to come here this weekend for a lot of reasons. We participated with some disagreement internally in 95. We did not participate in any of the Million Man March anniversaries since then. We were asked personally to participate inside of this process as it come to the mall. We voted unanimously not to do that. People lobbied us, lobbied me to change our position. We agreed, okay, we will do limited participation for the sake of unity. We will not exacerbate or highlight our differences and disagreements. We would not participate in efforts of mass mobilization to the event. We would simply mobilize our constituency. There are at least three factions of the AAPRP. We are the smallest and the poorest. So we didn't pass out leaflets. We didn't compete with nobody. We didn't conflict with nobody. In fact, we organized buses that got diverted. But if the if the if but we, but we are here, one to support the people who are there, to see old people that we haven't seen in 20 years, to see new kids on the block who are just coming up and encourage them to participate. But bottom line, this is a reunion of our forces. 
an independent delegation of our people who will then go and join the march. Another aspect of the or else is that we retain our vote. I'm tired of us being the midnight booty call for the Democratic Party where they come around and ask us for our votes and we faithfully give our votes without any kind of recompense, any kind of benefit, and Negroes go to the poll regularly, faithfully and dependably, looking for a messianic panacea to their problems with the election of Democrats at every level of office. We got a black mayor in Chicago, Harold Washington, it's gonna be different, but the ghetto stayed there. We got a black mayor in Philadelphia, Wilson, good, it's going to be different. The ghetto stayed in Philadelphia. And with David Dinkins and with Thomas Bradley in uh, Los Angeles and with every other mayor, whether it was Ernest Morial in New Orleans, with every other mayor, even Coleman Young, the great Coleman Young of Detroit, they were unable, using the traditional democratic machine politics, to change the condition of their people. Look at President Obama. He's elected in office. He has a darker hue of complexion, but what is his ability to change and ameliorate the condition of the life of the people from which he comes? Very small, because he is the black man managing the affairs of white people and sitting in the office that they sent him to. So this year, we're gonna reflect the degree of political maturity that's been taught to us by the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. We're not giving anybody any vote until we see what their promises are on the agenda that we put in front of them. And if we put an agenda in front of them and they double cross us, we have to use our strength to pull them out of office. So looking back on the Million Man March, it's highly questionable whether the um, march actually accomplished anything of any real lasting value, because if it did, uh, it's doubtful there would have been the need for a march in 2000, the so-called Million Family March, yet another march in 2005, the Millions More Movement, and now the impending Justice or Else rally. Um, and whenever uh, those uh, proponents of the Million Man March are challenged to demonstrate in what way the march accomplished anything of value, they point to the fact that the Million Man March produced a, a kind of a, a bump of 1.6 million black men partaking in the 1996 presidential elections over and against those who partook in the 1992 presidential elections. Now, by that measure, the Million Man March could arguably be regarded as a complete disaster for black America for the simple reason that Bill Clinton was essentially re-elected um, by the increased participation of those black men. And as Clinton recently acknowledged, his um, omnibus crime bill and the ruthless enforcement of its three strikes and your out pro uh, provisions resulted in the, gr in the greatest um, increase in the incarceration of black men and women that has been witnessed under any administration, exceeding even those black men and women incarcerated under Ronald Reagan's war on drugs. So to the extent that one of the accomplishments of the Million Man March was the increased black male voter participation in the 1996 elections, and to the extent that though that participation helped to re-elect Bill Clinton, and he then rewarded black America through his mass incarcerations under three strikes and you're out, it is arguable that the Million Man March was one of the greatest disasters to befall black people. And so there's a danger, and this is something that one hopes uh, justice or else doesn't end up being, is effectively a kind of campaign event for the election of Bill Clinton's wife, Hillary Clinton, in, 2000, um, in 2016, uh, uh, because she could be an even more disastrous uh, uh, president for African Americans, assuming they rally behind her, than uh, Bill Clinton proved to be thanks to the electoral bump and bounce he got from the Million Man March. I've never heard the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan condemn the process by which Obama got into office. He did point out the fact that before he was elected, he absolutely was selected. So we know that that process wasn't just an effect for President Obama, that's just something that goes on, that they decided that okay, it's time now, we'll run the brother and we'll put him in office. 
That's no no mystery. It's not something that the minister came up with a conspiracy theory. No, that's just reality in politics. So that is what he was talking about, that he was selected before he was elected. However, the minister being a just man and a realist is saying that as he saw that many people loved Obama that voted for him, there was still a large segment of those that hated him, hated him along the lines that he was black, hate him now as a, along the lines that, oh, you know, he's a suspected Muslim. See, so the minister was trying to say in that think tank with Tavis Smiley that Obama can't be blamed for the country's problems. The country was already sinking. That's the thing. Who wants to be a captain on a sinking ship unless you got the plan to get that ship to dry land and repair it and then go back out to sea? So the point is, dear brother, is that we have to realize that the president has done some things and we may not be as happy about what he's done with eight years. But the point is the minister is a brother and he's saying, OK, come on home because he's a brilliant man. Ain't no doubt about that. He's a beautiful man. He's just in the wrong seat because that's Pharaoh's seat, according to some of us that read scripture. And so come on home, the minister said, and bring your brilliant mind to address the needs of our people from that level. Lastly, as you say about the other candidates, the minister does not desire that we throw all of our eggs in the basket of the Democratic Party just because, just because. That's been our tradition, that the Republican Party is Satan, but the Democratic Party is the lesser of the evil. No, it's all evil. It's just that one is hardcore and one is soft, but still, same people. So he felt a need for us to re-examine, brother, that bringing the scholars, the political scientists together and see, why don't we start a party? It's America. And let us see whether or not we can run candidates that could run on the line of bringing about change in the best interest of the suffering people. Since we claim that this is a country that is for the people and by the people, then let's see whether or not America will stand up to that real agenda that it claims to be the founding principles of. You can bring a crowd to a concert. I can bring a crowd to a clown show. That doesn't mean anything. What are you doing with that crowd? How are you mobilizing that crowd? Are you mobilizing that crowd? I mean, the March on Washington had to do with legislation. It was a push for legislation. It was a push for laws. I, there was an agenda surrounding it. You're pushing for what? This this sort of myth of, 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 of the black dollar and don't spend money on Christmas or whatever that is. That's not a movement. That's not a movement. If you were doing something on the ground to actually mobilize these people and use them in terms of what you were trying to do and in terms of moving the black agenda forward. If you were doing that, then we could talk about the relevance of, of Farrakhan. But Farrakhan actually neutralizes black people because he tells them that you don't need politics. All you need is yourself. All you need is other black people. All you have to do is get together with the Nation of Islam and let us show you how to eat and show you how to garden. So he neutralizes black movements. He's actually detrimental to black people and in turn into our black policy agenda. They, just because you can do the idea that, that you can get a bunch of people together and that means you're relevant. I mean, Chief, Chief Keefe in Chicago, the rapper gets a bunch of people together. Does that mean he's irrelevant as a black, that he's relevant as a black leader? The biggest day, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan said, brothers and sisters, is not 10, 10, 15, but really 10, 11, because it's about what we have to go back home and do. So we must go back and organize and deal with the local issues where we are and then expand out to the state level. And then with that taking place all over the country, then we can bring effective change to our communities and our condition and eventually the country. So this is the biggest part, not the day of, but come on and be there. But the day after is really when we have to get down to the work to do what Dr. King said, have an economic withdrawal of Christmas and an economic boycott of the Black Friday situation. This is what we're going to do. But remember, justice or else.